back again. Sometimes preachers are so excited to say what they have to say that they forgot the sequence of things. Yeah. Uh, and talking about preachers, um, last week uh, when uh, Terry kickstart the series on the leading causes of life, he actually mentioned a little bit about preachers. You know, basically feedback about, about preachers. Preachers too hot, I mean too loud, too soft, and so on. But actually, they also have comments about uh, the preacher's sermon. And sometimes these comments are quite subtle. They use Bible places or Bible names to describe certain sermons. And so when you hear a person saying that, uh, oh, that sermon is a Jericho sermon, actually what it meant is that the preacher kept on going round and round seven times around the same point. Yeah. Or they can say that it's a Mount Sinai sermon because it is all the do's and don'ts. Thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt do this. So it's a Mount Sinai sermon. Or if they say that it is like a Sodom and Gomorrah sermon, I'm sure you all know what it is all about. It's a lot of fire and brimstone because that's what uh, Sodom and Gomorrah went through. But if they use names, it can also be quite interesting because they can say that it is a Methuselah sermon. And you know Methuselah live a very long life. And when you say your sermon is like a Methuselah sermon, your sermon is too long, very, very, very long. And sometimes they use the word Eutychus sermon. Not many of you are familiar with Eutychus, but Eutychus is mentioned in the book of Acts. And you know what happened in the city of Troas when Paul was preaching? He was talking on and on until over to the midnight hour. And this guy, and they actually mentioned his name, fell asleep and fell down from the third story. And so you have a Eutychus sermon, it means that people may fall asleep. But the encouragement for all of us is that we want to be like the Burans. And hopefully it is a Buran sermon. Because whenever God's words is preached, you want to be like the Buran. Because they receive the word with all eagerness and they search the scriptures. And so this morning, as I share with you uh, the message, I hope that it is God's words that is speaking to you. It is not me, I'm only his messenger. But when you hear the word, it is God speaking to you, speaking to your heart, that it may make a difference in your life as we talk about the leading causes of life this morning. And so, the leading causes of life. I think all of us uh, know about um, or what we heard last week from uh, Brother Terry about the two choices or the two things in life that we have made choice. I, I to uh, have words of death, essentially actions or words that focus on what's wrong and what's bad. And he mentioned that if you do that, it can destroy, it can do harm. And the idea here is that we want us to focus on the words of life. The words that provide a framework where life can occur and grow and thrive and solutions to problems are found. And from there, he outlined the different uh, topics that we're going to talk for the next couple of weeks on connections where we have fellowship, we have find strength, and there's healing. Coherence, where we can find purpose and meaning. Agency or actions, which tells us of what we do and what is done through us. And of blessings, of how we can express agape love to others. And finally, hope of the forward look of trust, which believes that things can change for the better. And one thing he mentioned about all these things is that it's all about relationships. Everything revolves around relationships. And it is even more so as we focus on today's topic on connections. It specifically talks about relationships. And I want to invite you to really listen of, to what relationships or what connections can help you in your life find strength and to find healing. When we talk about connections, I think all of us are fairly uh, familiar with connections. The first thing that we come to think about, I mean, come to our mind will be, I have connections. Connections that will improve our status in life. Connections that will progress our career. And sometimes connections that will help us to get something that we want. But that is not the intent of this morning's uh, message. No. This morning I'm going to talk about the kind of connections that will give strength, that will provide healing in our lives. Not about those things that will meet our uh, material or physical needs. And as mentioned by Brother Bing Chuan early on, actually human beings 
are predisposed to connections. We are social creatures. We actually thrive on social connection to each other. From the very first time or when we are born, a child has already started his connection with his parents. And as he or she grows older, he has connection with his siblings, with his grandparents, eventually with his friends and his colleagues. And if you can see the, the network, the connection will be like spreading out, you know, linking all the linkages here and there. And it becomes very complex. And that's where our minds are designed for the task of recognizing, initiating, managing, and responding to highly complex social relationships. That we are able to connect, we are able to filter, we are able to you know, recognize you know, all the connections that we come across. A case in example, last Friday, I went to the airport to pick up uh, Maureen uh, from a trip. Out of the multitudes of people, you know, airport can be very crowded, I was able to single her out among the crowds and of course some of her traveling companions. And that's how our minds are able to do, that we are able to single out and filter out those that we are connected to, even among the midst of the crowd. And it is a very unique thing that God has designed us for. And one of the book, Care of the Soul, actually put it this way. One of the strongest needs of the soul is for community. But community from the soul point of view is a little different from its social forms. The soul yearns for attachment, for variety in personality, for intimacy and particularity. So it is in these qualities in community that the soul seeks out and not the like-mindedness and uniformity. And so when we talk about connections in this form, it's not about all of us being uniform, all of us being alike, but they actually seek for attachment, seek for intimacy. And in essence, this is what connection does. It gives life to the life that we have because we are connected. It gives meaning, it gives coherence. It makes our life that much fuller when we have all these connections. And in essence, when we talk about connections, it's trying to tell us that we should move away from being self-centered because people are involved to other-centered. And the Bible also says this in similar light. When Paul stressed in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, that we are to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So we should move away from self-centered to other-centered because connections involve people, other people. And just like the picture in the tree, we notice that there are people on the trees. That when we, when, when we are connected, the tree becomes much fuller and our life becomes that much fuller and we are strengthened and we are able to enjoy life much more. And when we talk about connections, connections is essentially about sharing. You know, it says, a burden shared is a burden half, and the joy shared is a joy double. We have all encountered such things in our life, whether we share our burden or we share our joy. And it's quite uh, apparent when we travel overseas. You know, when I travel overseas and I go to a church, for the first time. These people don't know me. But because we are connected through the blood of Jesus, we are one family in God. They welcome us, welcome me warmly. You know, they are so hospitable. They bring me to their home, feed me. And sometimes I remember in back in 2004 when I was in Sydney for a training. They also invite me to go and preach. They invite me to support their evangelistic effort in another town. We are so connected because we are in the body of Christ. They are prepared to share their burden and they are prepared to share their joy. And when we talk about sharing joys, we can see, in, especially in grandparents, you know, when they have grandchildren, you know the joy that they have when they start showing all their grandchildren's photographs and videos. And their joy is doubled or tripled whenever other people also enjoy that. And that's where the connection comes in, that we are able to share all this, whether it's burden, whether it's a joy that we have. But connection is more than that. I think it comes in very, very uh, relevant when we have life setback. 
There's a difference between someone who is connected and someone who is isolated. When we face life setbacks, it can be a crisis, it can be a medical uh, crisis, or some other crisis. Now, they say that the healing and survival is best when you have multiple connections. Whether we have connections with God, with the church, with the family, with friends, and if you are in a hospital with the medical staff, with the doctors, it makes a lot of difference on how you go through that rather than those who are isolated or lonely. And lastly, we heard a very good example when Brother Terry shared about Terry Lee's uh, uh, recent medical condition. They are strangers here in the sense they are from US, they come here. But because they are part of the family of God here, through their connections, people pray for them, pray for Terry Lee and the family. They visited her, you know, they took time to be with her, comfort her. But more than that, they also got connected with the, the medical staff. And with their connections in the US, they became a blessing to the people there of how you know, they got all their uh, superheroes uh, uh, attire and spread the joy around. And it's all because of the connections that we have. So a setback is not a setback when we are able to have such connections. And when we have all this these kind of things that we have, that we have gone through, the memories that we have, the life lessons that we have in the past, we tend to anticipate what we want for the future. And as a result, we actually shape our choices to achieve certain connections that might give us life. To avoid all these pitfalls that we have gone through, to ensure that you know, we make connections that will give us life, that will make our journey that much better and it is done on a daily basis almost every day the decision then is whether we want to separate or we want to attach whether we come to a certain group people company that we meet should we attach to them because they will enhance or give value to our life or we should move away from them and as a result, we realize that the best things in life are unknown things. You know, we can have a house, a car, all the money in the world. We can have everything we have to, to live with, to make our life comfortable. But if that's the only thing that we have, then we've got nothing to live for. Yes, we can have a comfortable life, but if we do not have meaningful relationships, there's really nothing to live for. All these things will count for nothing. In, this, in a book uh, written by a local author called Live Well, Love Much, Love, Auto, uh, Love Often, the author mentioned there are three pillars for success in life. And these three pillars are, number one, spirituality. Spirituality essentially is a core. That is from within. It is your character, your integrity, your passion, your compassion, your values, your enthusiasm. What is in you? And the second thing, the second pillar is that of skill. The skills to work, the skills to perform in our daily lives. And oftentimes, as the years go by, some of these skills need upgrading. And as a Christian, the skills to do well in the kingdom of God. The book of uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we need skills as well. And finally, we need relationships. The connections that we talked about earlier on, the connections that will make our life that much more meaningful. Now what happens if you have some and you don't have the others? Let's look at it. If you have skills and relationships, you're very skillful, you have a lot of you know, connections and friends, but you have no spirituality, then your work will have no vision or direction because there's no values, nothing to drive you. You just go through the motion. And worse off, because your character and integrity is not there, your relationships become manipulative. You are using people for your own needs, for your own ends, to achieve what you want to achieve. But what happens if you have skills, uh, no, spirituality and relationships, 
but no skills. And then what will happen is that your life will be limited, whether in your life goals or as servants of God, because you're not capitalizing on what God has given you in your life, your abilities, your talent, and you'll be limited in what you can do for God. But what happens if you have uh, spirituality and skills and no meaningful relationship? I put it to you. What is the point of winning or finishing a race when there's no one at the finishing line to cheer you on? That sums up what happens if you don't have a relationship. You'll be lonely. You can achieve that degree. You can achieve that medal. You can achieve a lot of things in life. But if you do not have meaningful relationship, there's no one to share that with. Especially when you have life setbacks. You, can, you have no one to turn to to help you in the journey, to find the strength to carry on. And so we need all these three. And particularly in this morning, I want to stress on the value of relationship. That we ought to treasure that and build on our connections, our relationship, because we can do far more and enjoy much more when we have deep and meaningful connections and relationships. And through this, we can find strength, we can find healing in our life journey. And so when we understand the importance of connections and relationships, as I've just explained, what are the ways that we can strengthen this to help us to be not only better connected, but also the connection is in such a way that it will be something that you will find uh, it of value in your life. Well, the first thing that I want to suggest to strengthen this connection is that we need to connect. It doesn't make sense that we say that we have connection, but we don't even connect at all. And for us as Christians, the thing that connects us is Christ. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, it says that, Therefore, you have, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the Spirit, and of one mind. All this is possible because we are connected in Christ. We are united with Christ. Christ is the one that, that connects us. We have new life in Him. We are saved by the blood of Christ. But more importantly, we read in the Bible that we are added to the family of God. We are one big family. And through that, we are connected. We cannot become a Christian and say that we are Christian and not connect to the family. It is just, you know, it cannot happen. When you are a Christian, you are already part of the family of God. You are added to the family of God. And you cannot stay disconnected. You have to consciously make effort to be connected. In John chapter 15, Jesus actually emphasized the need for us to remain in Him, to be connected to Him, because that's where we find ourselves being able to grow and be productive. And so, in order for us to strengthen our connections, we need, first of all, to make sure that we are connected. We cannot be alone. We cannot be isolated. We need to make effort to connect. And the Bible also went to say that when we connect, we can enjoy the blessings of being in Christ. We can be united in purpose and motivation, in love and unity, regardless of race, our status, our abilities, or where you are. Because we are one family of God. And we are connected through the blood of Jesus Christ. We all know about Ephesians 4, about one spirit, one body. And it actually tells us that we are dependent, not independent of one another. 4.16 says, From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. And so you can imagine a body that we are connected to be balanced, functional, and coordinated. If we are missing some limbs, one or two limbs, or some of our organs are missing, whether externally or internally, we won't be balanced, we won't be fully functional, and certainly we will not be coordinated. And so for us to, be, uh, to have the connections that will give us strength and give us value and meaning in life, we need, first of all, to connect. 
Secondly, besides making the effort to connect, we need also to make the effort to congregate. Now, Christian fellowship is a key and essential part of our Christian life. I mean, when you read about the Bible, we don't read about people being alone. Yes, occasionally, you know, they are alone, spend time with God. But oftentimes, you read about them coming together. And when we read of that, we, we come across this word called kononia. And kononia is translated from the Greek to mean fellowship. And in some ways, it is translated to mean when you have something that you share in common, that you have communion. That's kononia that you will have something in common, that you have fellowship. And the Bible went on to talk about this. When in Hebrews 10, 24, 25, it says that, Now let us consider how we may spur one another towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And continue in Colossians 3, 16, it says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. There's a lot of one anothering verse in the Bible. And you notice that it didn't say, you know, spur yourself, meet with yourself, encourage yourself. No, it's all about one another. It is a group action. Spur one another, meet together, encourage one another, teach and admonish one another. And for that to happen, we have to come together. We have to congregate. And when we talk about congregating, we are not talking about limiting to Sunday alone. We don't, in the Sunday period, the one hour, two hours that we have, it's not going to help us towards this goal. We should find every opportunity when the church meets, church camp, retreat, you know, care teams, and other opportunities when we have. Because these are the opportunities that we can share, we can bond, and more than that, it provides accountability. That we are accountable to one another. That I help you in your spiritual growth, and likewise, you spur me in my spiritual growth. And through that, we then understand the value and power of connection by coming together. That is through this that we are recharged by God's word. That through this that we have sharing of faith, we have fellowship then we are able to disciple one another. That is the value of connection. And realize that coming together is not an end, but it's a means to an end, to our walk with God towards a greater and more uh, closer walk uh, with our Father in Heaven. And so, to strengthen our connections, we need to connect, we need to congregate, or come together. And lastly, we need to have a common mission, and I call it commission. Now, we all know Matthew 28, where Jesus tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. I think we all know the Great Commission. But sometimes we forget that it is not just a commission, just genetically, but really it's a commission for you and I. It's for all of us. And the problem usually is not that we are not, we are not working for God, or whether we are working for God, because we, all of us are doing it in some way or another. But it's whether we are working with each other for God. And that is the crux. Oftentimes, we allow differences, we allow pride, we allow cases where we are not in sync in our vision and mission of the local congregation. And we allow things like, you know, where we have other agendas to cause us to work in a way that actually we are closing the wall. You know, we are pushing on both sides that we have this wall to effective proclaiming of the Lord's word. That the others are not able to see the love and the gospel that God wants us to share. But instead, we should be working in sync. And that our common goal is to break down this wall, open up a space that people can see the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are not working to compete with one another. We are to work together with a common vision and mission for the glory of God. A good example is like a football team. Okay, I like football, so I tell you about football team. 
Now, in a football team, there are many you know, uh, people with different skills. Some can take free kicks. So whenever there's a free kick, he will take the free kick. Some can take penalty kicks. Yes, whenever there's a penalty kick, he will be the one assigned to take it. And there are strikers, there are defenders. But they are all working in coordination for single purpose. To win the game. All right? They want to win the game. You don't want to have a striker that shoot at his own goal. That's not good. Or a goalkeeper that doesn't want to save or make a save. And that's not good as well. And so, in essence, when we want to work, we need to have a common when we have we need to have a common goal. We need to be in sync. And when I talk about being in sync, let me share with you uh, an example of what are the damaging effects when we are not in sync. Many of you, I'm sure almost all of you have traveled in aircraft. Now in, in an aircraft with multiple engines, whether multiple propellers or multiple engines, the engines and propellers are all in sync. They have to be in sync to re reduce the noise and the vibrations to the aircraft. Now, when they are not in sync, what will happen is that not only the noise will go up, but the vibrations will also increase. And over time, over a prolonged period, these vibrations, if it's not um, taken care of, it will cause fatigue to the structures, to the propellers, if there's any. Okay? And in time to come, it may even result in failure. And so you can see how damaging it, it can be if we all are not in sync in our vision and mission when we are connected. That if we continue in this, the tensions that we will have will stress the congregation to the point that in time it may result in us not being effective in our outreach and possibly may even cause the church to come apart. And so the saying that says, those that are able to work together, stay together, is very relevant. That we need to work together. Because when doing so, we become more and more connected and we stay together. And so, we know that all of us have a task. The task that is given to us in Acts 20, 24. That we are to finish a race. More than that, we are to complete the task the Lord Jesus has given us. And what is that? the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. And I said that earlier, the Great Commission is not selected people, it's for all of us. And we need to do that because we can proudly say that we are not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. But Philippians 1.27 went one step further. It says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of this gospel. Now the word striving together, from the Greek word, san etio. The word etio is, you know, is similar to the word Athletics that we, or athletics that we are familiar with. And the prefix sun, S U N, it means with or together. And so striving together gives you the picture of a team working together towards a common goal. And that we are coordinated, we are cooperating with each other for that purpose. And the purpose is for the faith of the gospel. We need to strive together as one, not as individual, but together as one. And how do we do that? They say that the best way to preach the gospel is to live the gospel. And that's where Philippians 1.27, the first part, it says, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live your life in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. Individually, collectively as a church, that all of us need to have a common mission and vision. And when we do have that, our connections will be really that much stronger for the world to see that we are the light of the world and we are the salt of the earth. And they want to know more about how we are connected through the blood of Christ, through the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so in conclusion, or in summary, let me 
say again, our relationships, our connections are an important and integral part of our Christian life. You cannot run away from it. No matter how you see, you are all connected somehow. All right? It's how we value and treasure them and how we build on them. And in order to do that, we need to strengthen our connections by first being connected. Yes, we are connected with Christ, but we also need to connect to the body of Christ by coming together, congregating. It is not a means, it's not an end by itself, but it's a means to the end that you will strengthen us, strengthen our connections. And lastly, when we are able to work together, we have a common mission and vision. That's where we are able to stay together. That's where our connection will be strong. And because of that, we can truly find strength and healing in times of need. The song that we sang earlier, Common Love, sort of encapsulate what connection is all about. I will read. It says that connections is a common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord, and a common strength when we are weary, common hope for tomorrow, and a common joy in the truth of God's words. And that's what I think connection is all about. That we want to embrace it, we want to strengthen it, because in times of need, it is there to help us, to strengthen us. In times of joy, it is there for us to really share the joy with all that we know and all that we come across with. This morning, when you listen to this message, earlier I, I say again, the preaching of God's word is to speak to your heart. I trust that this message or the word of God will fill your heart, will encourage you, and in some ways you feel that you're convicted of it, that you want to do better for our Lord, for the church that meets here uh, in Pasir Panjang. Where you can put down your prayers, the elders will pray for you. But there's also a song of invitation that if there's any need, as we stand together to sing the song, we invite you to come forward as we sing the song.